Well, good morning. I want to start out by expressing my gratitude for uh, Senator Betancourt uh, and Representative Kane for uh, their joining with us here today to talk about an issue that is so important to our fellow Texans, and that is election integrity, uh, but also so important to making sure uh, that uh, we protect uh, the fabric of our democracy uh, in the state of Texas. So thank you not just for being here, but thank you for your leadership uh, in the session. You know, there, there's really one thing that all of us can and should agree upon, and that is we must have trust and confidence in our elections. And that's not just me saying that. That is the United States Supreme Court that says that. Uh, in opinions that is issued on voter fraud-based cases, the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court has been emphatic that we must have trust and confidence in elections, and one way to do that is to make sure that we reduce the potential for voter fraud in our elections. But the fact is, election fraud does occur. I know that in part because of my time as Attorney General in Texas when I did make arrests and engage in prosecutions of people across the state for election fraud. The current Attorney General similarly has made arrests and prosecutions for voter fraud. But this isn't something that's partisan in nature uh, because even President Barack Obama engaged in prosecuting voter fraud in the state of Texas. When Barack Obama was president, he used his a U.S. attorney for the Southern District in Texas, as well as the FBI, uh, to prosecute a voter fraud scheme in South Texas where cocaine was being used to pay uh, voter harvesters. And so it doesn't matter what party you're in. It doesn't matter your party affiliation. What matters is our collective effort to agree and then to achieve the goal of ensuring that we promote integrity in the election process and that achieves our goal of instilling trust and confidence in elections. So the bottom line is this. Election fraud is unacceptable. And that's exactly why I made it an emergency item this session. And know this, because the fact is most people don't know what I'm about to tell you. And that is election fraud is far more than just a legislative concept or a goal to be achieved. In the state of Texas, is a constitutional obligation. Texas Constitution, Article 6, Section 4 says this. In all elections by the people, the legislature shall make such regulations as may be necessary to detect and to punish fraud and preserve the purity of the ballot box. That is the mandate to these leg legislators, and that's exactly what they are seeking to achieve. Our objective is very simple. And that is to ensure that every eligible voter gets to vote. It's also to ensure that only eligible votes are the ones that count at the ballot box. The integrity of elections in 2020 were questioned right here in Harris County with the mail-in ballot application process. The county elections clerk attempted to send unsolicited mail-in ballot applications to millions of voters, many of whom would not be eligible to vote by mail. Election officials should be working to stop potential mail ballot fraud, not facilitate it. And that's exactly why the Texas Supreme Court was right to put a stop to what Harris County was trying to do. Also in Harris County, election officials created drive through voting, which is not authorized by law. Texas law does allow curbside voting as an option only for certain voters, such as voters unable to enter a polling place without personal assistance. But election officials in Harris County set up drive through polling places for any voter, including those who do not qualify for curbside voting. Whether it's the unauthorized expansion of mail-in ballots, or the unauthorized expansion of drive through voting. We must pass laws to prevent election officials from jeopardizing the election process. We also must ensure transparency in the polls, which is why Texas does allow poll watchers from each party to participate in the voting and the tallying process. Poll watchers are critical to election integrity. 
But this last election, we saw poll watchers being denied the ability to do their job. This session, we must pass laws to make sure that poll watchers in Texas are not going to be obstructed from observing the ballot counting process. So once again, uh, I do want to express my gratitude, but probably speaking for all Texans, the gratitude of everybody in the state of Texas uh, to Senator Betancourt as well as Representative Kane uh, for their efforts to step up and to provide robust legislation that they are working with the legislature as we speak uh, to get through the Capitol and to get to my desk so I can sign it. So with that, I will uh, open it up to Senator Betancourt to tell more about what he's working on. And thank you, Governor. And thanks for coming in and highlighting what is needed, which is a, a real strong voter integrity discussion in the legislature and bills coming your, to your desk for your signature. Uh, you mentioned a couple problems in Harris County that I want to highlight. One of them was, yes, we did not need to have two million absentee ballot forms mailed out. Uh, that was decided by the Texas Supreme Court, so it's not just, as you mentioned, not just the federal uh, courts that have been weighing in on this, but they're using, uh, you know, Article uh, 6, Section 4 again uh, as a basis for many decisions. And the reason why it's important is simply this. Um, two million absentee ballot forms mailed out in the middle of an election would have caused, in my opinion, voter chaos because voters that had never seen this before would have been thinking, yes, that's what I should be able to do. Well, no, we're not a universal uh, ballot, uh, absentee ballot state like Oregon and others. And more importantly, we didn't need that two million absentee ballots to set a, a record voter total in Harris County, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, which is only high by numerically, but the highest percentage in over 30 years. And so what I tried to do as, as uh, someone as a former election official is to add in bills that will be picked up uh, by Chairman Kane and Chairman Hughes, who's up running uh, uh, state affairs as we speak, which is why he's not here this morning. And I called him my integrity seven. Well, it had turned out to be maybe one or two more. But, um, but the first bill was to stop the absentee ballot mailing. Uh, the integrity seven really comes from my experience in watching elections. And one of my pet peeves, and I just can't believe we're still doing this in Harris County, is we're allowing people to be registered to private P.O. boxes. Now, nobody in this room lives in a two-inch by three-inch private P.O. box. But in Harris County, 4,880 people, nearly 5,000 people are still registered. And in some UPS stores, like at 1302 Wall, it's over 50. And some 66, some 77, whatever. It's, it's preposterous that we are allowing this to happen because these people don't live at the UPS store. They don't live in a two by three inch uh, PO box, but it's part of what we need to have, which are just common sense reforms. Now, I know Chairman Kane is gonna talk about this uh, because I think it's important that we also get the judiciary ready to go on election contests mm -hmm. because that way, if political parties of either of all types or candidates have an issue, they should be able to get to a rocket docket on election uh, uh, election day or early voting. My bill was SB 110. However, Chair McCain has it in House Bill uh, uh, 6 as well. Um, and uh, finally, I want to say that I think it's an important concept of uniformity uh, in elections, where as an election official, you want to make sure that people understand that there's uniformity, what the laws are, and that's why I filed a bill uh, that would have uniform election laws in the state that I think are picked up both in House Bill 6 as well as in Senate Bill 7, just to have seven to seven hours for early voting, um, and obviously for election day. That would increase the number of hours in rural, in some cases suburban Texas, it may decrease from what the attempt was in Harris County, but again, I don't think uh, that that was uh, uh, something that would be looked on by anything but a positive because everyone can uh, can can view those hours and and whether they're working a, a shift or not, they've got a, a chance to work on that uh, during the work on that effort over the weekend, et cetera. So I don't think there's any denial of voter rights with that. I think uniformity is what we need in Texas. So rural voters coming home to work have the same access as, as urban voters. Now, with that, I want to uh, pass it back to you, Governor, as it's your press release. Right. So you can, I'm in conference, so you can pass it to the Chairman. I'm, I'm going to pass it to uh, Chairman Kane. Thank you, Governor Abbott and Senator Betancourt. 
House Bill 6 is part of a, a larger package in the House uh, where, we're, where, we, where we be, uh, you know, seeking to ensure the integrity of our electoral process. Since Speaker Phelan had named me as chair of the House Committee on Elections, uh, I've met with multiple members of the House, um, <coughs> discussed bills, and we're working really close together, both, both sides of the aisle, on, to see what they want to have done this session. You know, the House, as I would say, is the closest to the people. House members have heard from our constituents, and we filed bills uh, based on the things that they've heard from them. And I believe it's, again, it's incumbent on the Texas legislature to get this right, that uh, elections, the bedrock of our republic, should be free, fair, and secure. At the main point of House Bill 6, the very beginning, is this idea that we should have standardized and uniform elections, that the rules are the rules. What the legislature said and how an election should be conducted, that's the rule. It's, it's predictable. Everyone should know that. You know, in the Texas House right now, we've got members that are rural and urban, and there's different rules that apply depending where you live. I would say that a, a Texan from Lubbock should be able to move to Harris County or Liberty County and know when they'll vote and the times and hours of those voting. Again, that makes it fair. It helps rural Texans feel like they have the same opportunity as urban Texans. We must, of course, snuff out fraud. The idea that voter fraud is a myth has been disproven time and time again. Not only is it a duty of the Texas legislature to rid ourselves of that, as is said in Article 6, Section 4 of the Texas Constitution, but we owe it to people in communities that can be easily taken advantage of. By snuffing that out, we're actually helping them. You know, the only form of voter suppression is when a illegitimate voter, an ineligible voter, casts a ballot. When an eligible voter casts their ballot, what they're actually doing is they're silencing the voice of an American citizen, of someone that is eligible to vote. It's wrong, and we should stop it. Very good. Uh, with that, we'll take a few questions. I want to ask about uh, 1114, uh, one of the Senate bills in there. Uh, it seems to uh, have to be a repeat of the voter purge issues that we had uh, two years ago. Uh, it, it has a, a, a line in there about you know, citizens, you know, people putting in driver's license uh, requests when they were not legal citizens yet and eligible to vote. But there's no <coughs> limit on the time window of when an election official would have to act on that. Are we just not doing the same thing we did two years ago where people who 20 years ago may not have been legal citizens sure. but have since become legal citizens are going to be targeted? Jeremy, no. Uh, as a former election official, you have to scrub all that data and you have to look at every individual data stream to make sure you understand what it means. What 114 does is allows the ability for Secretary of State to do cross checks with data, but how you do it is up to good operational control as well as rulemaking. Now the important thing is, was I did, uh, I did uh, 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 you know, purges as well as uh, roll cleanup as far back as 1998. When I came in as voter registrar, we had 50,000 deceased and felon registrations. And by, in 1998, we had that number was knocked down by well over 90% by the year 2000. So you always look at what your data is, and specifically, you have to use the DPS data very carefully to make sure granularity you understand that. Because, for example, felons, you know, because of their term of service, they can come back, so you have to look at their probation period. So, so all that does is allow the, uh, the event to occur, but it must be done with extreme detention to detail. But didn't we do that in 2019? Weren't those same rules in place when you asked no, the, the state this, to do it? No, this bill was not in place, and those same rule, rules were not in place. And, and so that's, we're trying to provide structure to that because, because look, uh, keeping the voter roll clean is the first part of integrity in the voter process. If you don't have a, a voter roll with integrity, then your, your election's open to fraud and questioning. So, uh, so everything that's on this bill is from, uh, on that bill as well, is from my understanding as a former elections official of how to do it and how to do it right. Mm -hmm. Next question. Okay. Well, when you, when you talk about talk to the bottom, it's a little bit more convoluted. Uh, the, the, what we look for and what we've seen in the past uh, is that election fraud takes place. I have no doubt that it took place here uh, in, in the state of Texas. Uh, we wait for allegations to be made. We don't root it out ourselves. 
uh, allegations are submitted to the Secretary of State's office as well as to the Attorney General's office, and then investigations are conducted. Uh, what we have found in the past, there have been some local elections, uh, the outcome of which was altered uh, by election fraud that took place. Uh, right now, I uh, don't know how many or if any elections in the state of Texas in 2020 uh, were altered because of voter fraud. What I can tell you is this, and that is any voter fraud that takes place sows seeds of distrust uh, in the election process. Uh, the more distrust in the election process, uh, the more that it challenges uh, the fundamentals of democracy itself. Uh, there is an obligation, uh, not only in the Texas Constitution, but uh, as articulated by the United States Supreme Court, that we remove that distrust by ensuring that we do all we can to ensure that every eligible voter will be able to, to cast a vote, but no one will be able to cast an illegal vote. Two more questions. How do we ensure the accuracy of machines and the uh, allowance of observers that are impartial and hand counting? Would you start over again? How can we ensure the accuracy of our voting machines right. and the allowance of observers, uh, partial observers, and hand counting? Sure. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. There are bills on, on that exact thing. One, you'd ask about the impartiality of hand counting. We've, uh, we've got legislation in both chambers that ensure that people can properly observe and, and watch to see how those things are being done. We've got legislation that, in, that require um, uh, paper ballots versus mail-in ballots to be stored uh, securely in separate locations, but most importantly of all is to define who can be present to, to watch these tabulations so that people do not feel as though maybe something funny is going on behind the scenes. Again, the overarching goal of this is to restore the public's trust that, uh, that when they went and voiced their concern in the direction of their government, they, they felt like their voice would be heard. We, the, the polling numbers are very clear that a majority of Republicans and Democrats want to see election reforms that rebuild their faith in the electoral process. And if I could add, Chairman, mm -hmm. sure. uh, there's, there's two important concepts here. One is verifiable paper trail, which mm -hmm. is in both the Senate bill and the House bill. That's an important part of an election process because you get the advantage mm -hmm. of a direct digital machine as well as a paper ballot verification of it. And two, I have a, a bill that I'm basically calling the Poll Watcher Sunshine Bill, which is 1591, which talks about all the reasons why we need uh, poll watchers. But look, poll watchers should be available to look at any time and observe because that really is sunshine into the process. And irrespective of a party, they should be have access to where, mm -hmm. wherever it's in rural, suburban, or urban America, doesn't matter. They should have 100% access. All political parties of poll watchers and candidates that should. Governor Abbott, you said the objective is very simple. Well, there are bills on the subject to ensure that polling locations are distributed um, evenly throughout counties. So, for example, in some areas in Texas, someone may have to drive 50 miles to get to a polling location. Urban counties don't have that problem. And so there is data to support this idea that they should feel like they had the same opportunity uh, to easily be able to go and cast their vote. So uh, also I'll add, and then uh, Senator Betancourt may want to add more, and, and that is it's a fair point that it is more dense and more populous in Harris County uh, than it is in some rural county. But it's also true uh, that there are far more voting locations in Harris County than there are elsewhere. We do want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to vote, and that is why we have this early voting process that goes on seven days a week uh, for long hours every single day to make sure that someone does have the opportunity to vote, and then that's on top of uh, the opportunity to vote on election day. And so uh, there's so many days to vote. That's one reason why we did have a record number of votes uh, cast this past election. Uh, you know, there was always uh, this mantra uh, that Texas uh, was a non-voting state. We had an all-time record 
and the number of people who voted this last time because voters are more engaged and we expect that high volume of voting to continue. And just uniformity, transparency, consistency, wherever voters are, they should be having the same access to the, to that type of voting activity for early voting. And the fact that our current uh, pattern in law right now is to have uh, uh, you know, well over 10 days of early voting in a row. So uh, even in an urban area, everybody can access a poll from 7 to 7, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. All right, now that's the last question. Thank if, you, guys. If, uh, I want to ask you about your letter to Lieutenant Governor Patrick sure. on ERCOT. Uh, in it, you said that uh, you, you weren't opposed, you weren't, the, the PUC cannot change bills retroactively uh, from ERCOT, but are you against the idea of retroactively changing the bills uh, uh, changing those you know, billing rates retroactively and maybe hurting some utilities but helping others? Well, and for one, there's a constitutional provision on that. It's in the Texas Bill of Rights, Section 16, uh, where you cannot do things retroactively. Uh, Section 17 uh, involves takings of property. Uh, Section 16 also concerns uh, impairing the obligation of contracts. And so it's very complex, and that's exactly why uh, we need hearings to determine uh, would there be a taking, uh, would there be an impairment of a contract that has now already uh, been executed. And so these are very complex issues, and that's, that's exactly why the legislature is the right body to investigate this, to weed through all these complexities, and, and to make sure that if legislation is passed, it will satisfy the requirements of the Texas Constitution. All right, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.